We're finally ready to use what we've learned to design a simple computer. Although it is simple, it's powerful enough to run real programs, and it illustrates how the pieces of the von Neumann architecture fit together. We looked at the little man computer, which I've called the little Martian computer, and there are some problems with it. The biggest problem is that LMC is a decimal computer, but real computers are binary. The fact that real computers are binary is important because the use of binary representation has a powerful effect on how data are represented inside the computer. It also explains why there are powers of two every place we look. There's a certain amount of magic in the actions of the Little Martian, but there's no magic in real computers. There are simulators for the LMC, but the available simulators don't show fetch, decode, and execute clearly. So, we'll do something else. We'll design our own computer, which we'll call TBC, the Tiny Binary Computer. Let's remind ourselves about registers. Registers are small, fast storage within the CPU. A particular computer may have from a few to a few hundred of them. Registers will have one input and one or a few outputs. Conceptually, a register is the right number of latches. So a 64-bit register would have 64 latches inside it. The registers are from a few to 64 or more bits wide. And remember that fat arrows indicate multi-bit paths. So the fat arrows at input and the two outputs, if this were a 64-bit register, would carry 64 bits of data. Real computers have registers. The little Martian could remember things. In real computers, registers do that. Arithmetic results are stored in the accumulator or in general registers. General registers are also called data registers. The memory location to read or write is held in the memory address register. Data transferred to or from memory is held in the memory data register, also called the memory buffer register. The address of the next instruction is held in the program counter, and the current instruction that has been read from memory is held in the instruction register. Let's review that with a little more detail. General registers, also called data registers, are the registers available to the programmer. They receive the results of operations like arithmetic. If there's only one register, it's called an accumulator. The one register in von Neumann's original architecture was called an accumulator because it accumulated the results of arithmetic operations. There are two memory registers. The memory address register holds an address in memory either from which to read data or to which to write data. The memory data register holds the actual data, data or instruction words that have been read from memory or that are to be written to memory. The program counter holds the address of the next instruction, and that is central to the way von Neumann architecture computers work. The program counter gets updated shortly after each instruction is fetched. It can be changed by the CPU to implement branching. The instruction register holds the actual instruction fetched from the memory location pointed by the program counter. The decode phase of fetch, decode, execute examines the contents of the instruction register to decide what operation to perform. The instruction was something the little Martian remembered. In a real computer, well, we use the instruction register to do that. The calculator represented the arithmetic logic unit in the little Martian computer. That calculator could do three things. Receive data from the little Martian, that is keyboard input, perform arithmetic operations, addition and subtraction, and hold the result of those arithmetic operations in its window. In a real computer, two separate components do that. The arithmetic and logic unit performs the arithmetic and logic operations, and the data registers, or the accumulator, if there's only one, receives the results of the arithmetic and logical operations. LMC performs addition and subtraction with the calculator, so our arithmetic and logic unit is going to need to be able to perform addition and subtraction. Also, we have to be able to copy data into the accumulator, that is to enter numbers. To do what the little Martian does, we need add, subtract, copy, and increment functions. 
It's also useful to be able to generate constants like 0, 1, and maybe minus 1. So given that background, let's make an arithmetic logic unit. We're going to start with a full adder. This is the same circuit we saw in the study of digital logic. It's been slightly rearranged. It's still exactly the same circuit in terms of gates, wiring, and logic flow. The positions of the gates have been moved slightly to make adding to the circuit easier. It has two input bits, A and B, and a carry-in labeled C sub I, and produces an output labeled output and a carry-out labeled C sub O. Remember from our study of gates that the AND gate can function as an enable control. That is, it can control whether a signal passes through it or not. When the enable signal is zero or false, the result, F, the output of the AND gate, is zero no matter what appears on A. If the enable input is true, the output is equal to whatever appears on A. Now we can use that AND gate to provide an enable B input. We connected the output of the AND gate to the former B input of our full adder. We labeled one input of the AND gate B and the other input enable B. If enable B is true, the value of B is passed to the full adder. If enable B is false, the B input to the adder will be zero. That lets us copy A from the input to the output by adding zero. Back to our study of gates, the XOR gate can be used as a control inverter, that is to invert its input signal or not. When the invert signal is zero or false, A is passed through unchanged. If the invert signal is one or true, A is inverted, that is the result is not A. Now that we have both our AND gate and our controlled inverter, we can provide control inputs for A. The AND gate has inputs A and enable A. The output of the AND gate, this is all in red on the slide, the output of the AND gate goes to one input of the XOR gate. The other input of the XOR gate is labeled invert A. Two new control inputs. Enable A passes the A value to the XOR gate, or sends zero, and invert A complements, that is, inverts the A input. We're going to use this for subtraction. We now have a one-bit bit-sliced ALU. It's a full adder with three data inputs, A, B, and C sub I. There are three control inputs, enable A, invert A, and enable B. And there's an output and a carry out labeled C sub O. I can take several of these bit slice arithmetic logic units and form a full arithmetic logic unit. This is the same principle as the ripple carry adder. And like the ripple carry adder, we can have more than four bits. I used four because that's how many will fit conveniently on a slide. There's a new control input here, increment, and it's not really a new input. It is the carry in to that rightmost bit slice. We can now place a zero or a one on that rightmost carry in. Notice that invert A, enable A, and enable B are connected to every bit slice. In a real design, we'd have to worry about the fan out, the ability of one signal to drive many inputs. But we'd only worry about that in an electrical engineering course. For this course, we'll assume that those control signals will drive as many inputs as we need. We have a little bit more work to do. One of the things we have to do is check for overflow. Check for overflow compares the carry in on the leftmost bit to the carry out. And we use an XOR gate for that. Remember, one of the uses of XOR is to detect not equal. If the carry into the leftmost bit and the carry out of the leftmost bit are not equal, overflow has occurred. Overflow in this computer is an unrecoverable error. It's going to cause a program check. Now, 
Let's think about detecting overflow. Remember the overflow rule? The overflow rule for two's complement is that overflow has occurred if two numbers of the same sign are added and the result is of the opposite sign. That circuit on the previous slide XORs the carry in and carry out of the leftmost bit. Consider those inputs A and B on the leftmost bit or the sign bit. These are the sign bit inputs. XOR computes a not equal function, generates a one or true when the two inputs are not equal. So why does this happen? There are two possible cases. Case one, if the carry in to the leftmost bit is zero, the only way the carry out can be a one is if both the A and B inputs of the leftmost bit were one. That is, both of them are negative. The sum of one plus one plus zero for the carry in will be zero, and there will be a carry out of one. The two operands were negative, but the leftmost bit of the result will be zero or positive, and overflow has occurred. The second case, if the carry into the leftmost bit is one, the only way the carry out can be zero is if both A and B of the leftmost bit were zero, that is positive. The sum of zero plus zero plus one will be one with a zero carry. The two operands were positive, but the leftmost bit of the result will be one or negative, and overflow has occurred. We also have to detect positive. The check for positive just inverts the sign bit. If the sign bit is 1, negative, the P output will be 0. If the sign bit is 0, positive, the P output will be 1. Note that the value of all zeros is considered positive when we detect positive this way. We also have to detect 0. The 0 detector is a NOR gate with one input for each bit. In this example, it's a 4-input NOR. For a 12-bit computer, it would be a 12-input NOR. If all of the output bits from each bit slice are 0, the Z or 0 output will be a 1. So how do we use these? Um, overflow is a program check. We stop, nothing else can go on. It's an unrecoverable error. The P and Z values are stored in a latch, which is updated whenever a value is stored in the accumulator. So the PZ latch always reflects the value in the accumulator. Let's think about what we can do with this ALU. If enable A and enable B are true, and invert A and increment are false, the circuit functions as a full adder, adding A, B, and C sub I carry in, to produce the sum at out and the carry out at c sub zero. The subtract function applies the subtraction rule for two's complement numbers, namely take the two's complement of the subtrahend and add it to the menu end. The ALU forms the two's complement of A by inverting the A bits using invert A and adding one by setting increment. The adder then completes the operation. The copy A function computes A plus zero by turning off enable B. We could have implemented a copy B function in the same way, but we didn't. We chose not to because we don't need it. The increment A operation enables A and adds one using the increment control. If enable A, enable B, invert A, and increment are all false, the adder computes 0 plus 0 and emits a constant 0. If increment only is true, enable A and enable B are false, the adder computes 0 plus 1 and emits a constant 1. A constant minus 1 is produced by enable A and enable B both being false, but invert A is true. Having enable A false sends a logic zero to the XOR gate that serves as a controlled inverter. Invert A changes that zero to a one. Because enable B is false, the adder computes zero plus one for each position and produces a string of all ones. 
Recall that all ones is a twos complement minus one number. Much more complex ALUs are possible. This one does everything we need using only eight gates per bit with a few extra gates for V, P, and Z. A bus, in computer terminology, is just a bunch of conductors carrying related signals. The buses in this diagram of our computer are carrying data only. Other possibilities include addresses, control, and status signals, and some buses, like USB, carry power and ground. Once we understand how our ALU is designed, we can abstract away the design details. Remember that those fat arrows represent multi-bit paths. So, let's build a CPU. We start with an arithmetic logic unit using an ALU like the one we just designed. We add a register, this one is the accumulator, labeled ACC, and some buses. We add control unit to generate signals to the ALU. The control unit also generates signals for the registers. The closed head arrow labeled right signals the accumulator to load itself from the C bus on the rising edge of the clock, but only if the right signal is asserted. The closed head means that this signal depends on the clock. Open head arrows, out A and out B, if asserted, signal the accumulator to place its contents on the A bus or the B bus, respectively. These signals don't depend on the clock. The contents of the accumulator will appear on the selected bus for as long as the signal is asserted. Now we add some more registers, two more, the program counter labeled PC and the instruction register labeled IR. The disembodied arrows connecting to the registers all come from the control unit. Arrows with closed heads indicate loading the register from C at the end of the clock cycle. The open head arrows indicate sending the register contents to the A or B bus. Only the accumulator can connect to the B bus. The others send their contents only to the A bus. At most, one register can be selected for each bus in one clock cycle. As before, closed head arrows mean that the signal depends on the clock to be effective. Open head arrows mean the signal is effective whenever it's asserted. Now we add connections to memory. The, we need two more registers, the memory address register and the memory data register. The memory address register can only accept address information from the C bus. The memory data register can send data to the A bus or accept data from the C bus. We add one more register, the PZ latch. This one stores only two bits, the P and Z flags from the ALU. The closed head arrow means that P and Z are stored only on the rising edge of the clock. The right signal to PZ is the same as the right signal to the accumulator. That is, the P and Z bits are saved anytime the accumulator is loaded, and so always reflect the contents of the accumulator. The data path of a computer is the ALU, the registers, and the buses that connect them. The control unit isn't part of the data path. Let's look again at that clock cycle. This is the same one we have seen before. On the falling edge of the clock, the control unit sets up the control signals. Time passes and data propagate along the A and B buses. The longest part of the clock cycle is computation through the arithmetic logic unit. It has a lot of gates, so a fairly large gate delay. The results from the ALU propagate along the C bus. Then we add a little bit more time for tolerance, since not all electronic components are alike and they change with age. And on the rising edge of the clock, we store the result. There are two ways to design a control unit. Hardwired control units generate the necessary control signals using digital logic gates. Hardwired control units are fast, but they're also expensive because of the number of gates needed. 
Microprogram control units use a read-only memory to generate the bits of the control signals. Each word in the read-only memory must have enough bits to generate all of the control signals, and there must be one word for each data path cycle. Very simple digital logic reads the read-only memory. Microprogram control units are less expensive because they need fewer gates, but also slower because a ROM access is needed for each data path cycle. In addition to lower cost, microprogrammed control units have the advantage that the microprogram can potentially be changed. Some modern CPUs use hybrid control units. The frequently used instructions are implemented using hardwired control, and the less frequently used instructions are microprogrammed. Let's look for just a moment at the control unit for TBC, the tiny binary computer. The instruction register holds the operation code and the operand address. The control unit receives four bits of operation code from the instruction register. The P and Z flags from the last result stored in the accumulator stored in the PZ latch. For hardwired control units, we need three bits of cycle count, which will tell us where we are in the instruction cycle. The control unit generates four bits of ALU control, enable A, enable B, invert A, and increment. Read, write, and presence detect signals from memory, and the output and write signals for each of the registers. That's a total of 17 bits, four for the AOU, three for memory, four for the A bus, one for the B bus, and five for the C bus. Remember that the von Neumann instruction cycle is fetch, decode, and execute. Fetch gets an instruction from the memory location pointed by the program counter and advances the program counter. Decode determines what operation code is present and what data to use, and Execute performs the commanded operation. Instead of drawing pictures of the data path of a computer, we can use something called register transfer language to represent what's going on. The basic operation of the execute part of the instruction cycle is to send the contents of one or two registers through the ALU. The result gets stored in a register, possibly the same as one of the sending registers. Data are transformed according to the command sent to the ALU, so add, subtract, and so on. The copy command can move data through the ALU without changing it. We describe register operations with something called the Register Transfer Language, or RTL. Here is the Register Transfer Language for the store instruction. Remember, the store instruction stores the contents of the accumulator at the location pointed by the instruction address. Each rectangle represents one data path cycle. The first three cycles are the same for every instruction. They fetch the instruction from memory. In the first data path cycle, the program counter is copied to the memory address register. And we use that left arrow, so MAR receives program counter. In modern programming languages, we'd use an equal sign for that. In register transfer language, we use the arrow to indicate the direction of data flow. That parenthetical notation read memory says the control unit also generates a read signal to the memory system. In the next data path cycle, the program counter is incremented. That is, the program counter receives PC plus one. That happens while the memory read is still taking place. In the third cycle, the fetched instruction is in the memory data register. It's copied to the instruction register, and the fetch part of the instruction cycle is complete. The decode phase, the control unit is fast enough to decode the instruction before the next falling edge of the clock, and so does not require a data path cycle. The last two blocks, the last two data path cycles, represent the execute phase. First, the accumulator is copied to the memory data register, and in the last data path cycle, the square brackets around ADDR 
mean only the address part of the instruction register is copied to the memory address register. Memory is commanded to write and the instruction ends. Let's see how that looks with our actual TDC data path. On the falling edge of the clock signal, the ALU is commanded to copy. The program counter register is enabled on the A bus, and a write signal is asserted on the memory address register. During the clock's low period, data travel from the program counter through the ALU to the MAR. The rising edge of the clock signals the MAR to store the contents from the C bus. Let's look at another one, incrementing the program counter. On the falling edge of the clock, the PC register is enabled on the A bus, and the ALU is commanded to increment. The addition occurs, and the incremented program counter value appears on the C bus. On the rising edge of the clock, the incremented value on the C bus is stored in the program counter. So now we can introduce TBC, the tiny binary computer. Starting with a full adder, we built a CPU that will execute the little Martian computer instruction set, but it's a binary computer, like real ones. There's no little Martian and no magic. It's all digital logic with a little bit of ROM. We have been a little bit mysterious about input and output and about program loading. TBC is a 12-bit computer. There are four bits of operation code, so we have 16 possibilities of operations. There are eight bits of address, so that means we can have at most 256 words of memory, but we have installed only 128. When we look at a word as data rather than an instruction, it's a two's complement integer, 12 bits long, and so we have an integer range from minus 2048 to plus 2047. This program will run Little Martian programs if they're reassembled. There's a simulator for it. It looks like this, a control panel and a screen on the left, and then the data path and memory of the computer on the right. The simulator is on the web at computingconcepts.net slash tbc. Something I need to warn you about is that programs are stored in the browser's memory. That means you can't easily switch computers or even switch browsers because Chrome and Firefox use different memory. You can copy information out of TBC's source code pane and save it with Notepad or another editor. You prepare programs like this. You type source code into the left-hand pane of the assembler block and then give it a name. Look at the up, upper left corner where that red circle is, give it a name, and click Save As. Then click Assemble. Your program is translated into binary notation, represented as hex numbers, and saved again in computer memory. The assembled program looks like this. That object code column is the actual computer instructions as hexadecimal numbers. When the program is loaded into memory, only the object code, only the hexadecimal numbers, get loaded into memory. The control panel on the left lets us load and run assembled programs. Output appears on the screen. You can change the clock speed with slider, and you can step programs one instruction at a time. TBC is very close to a real computer design, but there is no magic. There's very little hand-waving, only in how programs are loaded. We didn't discuss the control unit much, but there's no magic there either. In theory, you could go to the Digital Logic Lab and build TBC. We've left out some details like power supply, clock generator, and so on. For this course, those are abstract details. You might wonder whether TBC is realistic. The first widely successful mini-computer was the Digital Equipment Corporation PDP-8. It used 12-bit words. It had an instruction set of eight instructions, so smaller than TBCs, but the PDP-8 could run a complete multi-user operating system. 
Here's what one version of it looks like. This is a desktop model and it's about the size of a bread box. Something for you to think about is that the PDP-8 had an add instruction, but no subtract instruction. So how do you think subtraction was performed? Here's a hint. The mnemonic for the add instruction was TAD for two's complement add. So you'll be using TBC to do one homework assignment. In order to do that, you have to understand the TBC instruction set and also one pseudo instruction. You'll use that TBC simulator that we mentioned just a little bit ago to develop and run your programs. So let's look at the instruction set and then we'll look at an example program. The HALT instruction, HLT, ends the program. When HALT is executed, nothing else happens. ADD adds the data at the memory address given to the contents of the accumulator. SUBTRACT subtracts data from memory at the address given from the contents of the accumulator. STORE, STO, stores the accumulator contents at the memory address given. LOAD, A, loads data at the memory address given into the accumulator. The previous contents of the accumulator are lost. BRANCH takes an unconditional branch to the address in the instruction. BRZ branches to the address given only if the Z flag is set, that is, if the accumulator contains a zero. Otherwise, execution continues with the next sequential instruction. BRP branch on positive branches to the address given only if the P flag is set, that is, the accumulator contains a positive number. Otherwise, execution continues at the next sequential instruction. N reads one 12-bit word from outside and places it in the accumulator. The previous contents of the accumulator are lost. OUT writes the contents of the accumulator to the screen. The contents of the accumulator are unchanged. Complete semantics of the TBC instruction set are in Appendix A of the textbook. One other thing, the TBC assembler recognizes the DAT for data mnemonic. DAT is not an instruction. It's a command to the assembler to reserve one location for data. Such assembler commands are called pseudo instructions because they're not really instructions. DAT can reserve data or also reserve and initialize data. So if we coded DAT20, one word would be reserved and it would be initialized with the value 20. And that's a decimal number. So for an example program, let's look at a homework from a previous semester. Design a program that displays the even numbers counting downward from 20 to 0 using the little man computer or tiny binary computer instruction set and looping. The program must halt after displaying 0. Write and turn in pseudocode for your solution and your final program. So the expected results look like this, 20, 18, 16, 14, and so on, and stopping at zero, so it would be 6, 4, 2, 0. Remember that the problem tells us we have to use a loop. I can't just use out 20, out 18, out 16, and so on. So let's look at the elements of the problem. We have to start at 20. We're counting down. We're doing even numbers only, so we're counting down by 2. We have to use a loop and we stop after displaying zero. We're supposed to turn in pseudocode. The pseudocode for the data is pretty simple. We need a number to start, that's 20, and the value to subtract, and that's a 2. Here's the pseudocode for the instructions. We get the starting number, that was a 20. I have a label print there, and I can use that for branches. Print the current value, check to see if it was zero. If yes, stop. Otherwise, subtract 2, go back to print, and go around and around until we do reach zero. Remember, the data has to go at the end. Now here's one way to approach it in TBC assembler code. We load the accumulator, LDA, with number. I print and I use an out instruction there, so I'm going to immediately print the number. Branch on zero to done, and if you look down, done has a halt instruction. But if 
it's not if it wasn't zero I subtract 2 and branch unconditionally back to print down at the bottom is our data uh, we have the label number and that's a dat 20 that was our starting number and the label 2 with a dat 2 that's our increment the value to subtract so you assemble the program with the assembler tab and I introduced an error on purpose 2 was misspelled the first time where it was defined so when we tried to use TWO we got an undefined label error message this might confuse you because the message appears where the value was used not where it was defined if you see a message like that look over at your definitions and see where you misspelled once the program has been assembled which you do by clicking the assemble button the object listing area looks something like this line number then address object code in hexadecimal the source code with labels then a column of instructions and a column of branch targets or values you run the program by going to the virtual machine tab using the pull down to find the name of your program click load and then click run the program runs and at the end memory looks like this that 07f at the high memory location comes from the presence detect signal sent to memory when the machine started 07f in hex is 127 and that's the highest memory location because we have 128 words but we started with zero your assignment this term will be different you might be asked to stop at a number other than zero in that case you'd have to save the current number to memory subtract a stop limit from it and that's how you do a compare you subtract numbers and branch on zero um, if there was a zero those numbers were equal but if they weren't equal you have to restore the current number from wherever you stored it in memory there's more help here a short video just a couple of minutes showing the complete mechanism for getting a program into TBC and running it. So three important facts in closing. Grace Murray Hopper helped with the invention of compilers so that we wouldn't have to program in assembly language. A high-level language like Python introduces a layer of abstraction between hardware and software so you can work with a language more comfortable to human beings than with that language of the machine. But we also have to remember Wirth's law. Software is getting slower, faster than hardware is getting faster. Moore's law is not keeping up with advances in software. This is important because assembly language programming, even just a little bit of it, helps you understand how the CPU and memory operate. And people who understand how the CPU and memory operate are better able to evaluate new technologies. People who understand how the CPU and memory operate are better able to write or evaluate efficient software. And that is everything I have to say about let's build our own computer.